Welcome to FM African Documentary and my name is Felix Mwenda. The greatest and most gruesome homicide that has ever gone down in the history of the African continent. The story of Kenyan Kembo boy who confessed to killing his entire family. In January the year 2021, a university student from Kenya shocked the universe and the continent of Africa at large. It's a story that left so many questions than answers, which has led me to dig deep and bring you the answers to this story. Walk with me as I explore one of the most dangerous homicide stories that graced Kenya and the whole of African continent. His name is Lawrence Simon Warwinge. After killing five of his family members, the 22-year-old was arrested days later as he was trying to escape the country. Something that left a lot of questions unanswered to many Kenyans. He confessed to the murder of his parents, two siblings, and a farmer at their home in Kembu County. Inspired by psychopathic assassin Villanelle, a real name, James George Coma, in a British park comedy, drama spy thriller tv series killing eve lawrence simon warwinge had planned to clear all his family members on saturday january 2nd 2021 after planning for over three months a detailed police report revealed how warwinge executed this plan where he started first by killing james kenyanjui a handyman who lived a few meters from the family main house. He then attacked his mother Anne Wanjiku, who was in the kitchen preparing supper, and then his, 20, his 9, 12 year old brother, who had responded to his mother's cries for help. The murder suspect then attacked his father Nicholas Warwinge, who had jumped from the balcony attempting to flee the scene. Last to be killed was his cousin, a 13 year old boy who was hiding under the bed. Before the murder, Warwinge told the police he had researched on the best way to execute the crime and com camouflage his ways out of the country. His alibi. On the day of the gruesome murder, he tried to convince his girlfriend to drink and smoke bang, but all was in vain. He expected the girl to pass out as he rushed to his rural home and butcher his skin and come back. He had hoped to use the girlfriend as an alibi after killing his family using carbon monoxide. Detectives from the homicide and the crime scene investigations unit at the Directorate of Criminal Investigations, the DCI headquarters, on the said day recovered crucial exhibits that unraveled the multiple victim homicide. And the suspect was squarely placed at the scene of crime with detectives trying to establish his motive. The suspect had alleged that he felt neglected by parents and that his younger siblings were also siding with the He claimed that he felt that the parents were out to kill him, a senior detective told us. First, the show prints impressions at the scene of the crime which were recorded and documented at the scene match those of the shoes that were recovered in my mayo on the day that he was arrested. Detectives had done, no, had done documentation to scale and later confirmed the measurement and soul pattern 
that matched those of the shoes that were recovered. He was a lone killer, killing five members. Though it was initially suspected that there was at least three killers at the scene, the probe had confirmed that the suspect was alone. After his shoes got soaked in blood, he removed them and walked in the house in his socks. He would later on the shoes which were recovered in my mayo before finally putting on a woman's shoe. He bought the lady's shoe in Dika. Detectives managed drew that up to establish the suspect confession and what transpired on that fateful day. Warunge asked the girlfriend to buy for him a knife in Dika. The nine inch knife with a metallic handle was among the exhibits recovered on the day he was arrested. At Dika, the suspect also bought a pair of trousers, a jacket, a lady's shoe, a piece of wig, and a female doll. He later cut off the doll's head. From Dika, the suspect proceeded to Nairobi Central Business District, the CBD, where he visited Urupak and Holy Family Basilica. Fearing that he could be searched at this church, he proceeded to one of the supermarkets where he deposited his luggage, which were in a red carrier bag containing the things he bought plus the knife. He left the supermarket with the luggage tag his bag behind and proceeded to the church at around 4 p.m. He went and boarded a Limuru board passenger vehicle and on reaching Limuru, he took another vehicle home in Wagunyu, Kiamba. On reaching home, he found James Kenyajui during the fateful day of the murder and asked him for a metal bar. He however did not disclose what he wanted to do with it. At one point he was very nervous and when the deceased asked him, he simply said he had a lot of stress without expounding. He would later catch Kenya Jui unaware and hit him at the back of the head several times before he cut his throat using the knife he had earlier bought in Dika. According to him, he decided to slit Kenya Jui's throat after he refused to die. A blood spot analysis would later confirm that the blood pattern on the wall curtain emanated from a high pressure vein on the drought. Waring remained around the initial crime scene until 8 p.m. when he saw his father being driven home in a taxi. The main attack shortly thereafter he scaled the perimeter wall. He got shocked by the electric fence but still managed to get into the compound. The father, Ed, brought home some bottles of Balozi beer, some of which were recovered in the house, the secondary scene. While in the compound, he saw the mother in the kitchen and he proceeded to the main switch and disconnected the power. He had some paraffin which he sprinkled on a green paper bag and set it on fire just outside the kitchen. Curious to know what was happening, the mother got out and he hit her at the back of the head with the metal bar. The brother, who heard the commotion, rushed, rushed to the door. Oblivious of the impending danger, was also attacked. The mother fell down unconscious while the injured brother rushed back to the room. All this while, the father was taking some beer in the bedroom upstairs, was not aware that the family was under attack from his own son. Shortly after, on sensing some commotion, he went downstairs but met the son armed with a knife. He ran back but the son followed him. Fearing for his life, he jumped from the bedroom balcony. He got injured and the son followed him where he stabbed him several times before slitting his throat. He would later Hear the father attempting to open the gate to escape, he pursued him and stabbed him even more, leaving him with his intestines out. Investigations revealed that at this point he was only on his socks. 
as he had removed his blood-soaked shoes. He then killed one of his brothers, Maxwell Jenga, class 7 people at Wagunyo Primary School and went room for room looking for the other brother. He found the brother Christian Jenga hiding under his bed in, in his room. The younger brother pleaded with him to spare his life. He would hear none of that and stabbed him several times before slitting his throats. After killing the family members, he showered and ate the food the mother was preparing and later sat down and watched a program of television. He slept on his father's bed until around 4 a.m. when he woke up and asked for a lift in one of the delivery vans. He went to Naivash and later went to Maimayo, the rural home of his girlfriend who was then in Dika. There, he burned some of his clothes and the mobile phones belonging to his parents, which he had collected from the house. He later went to Lower Kabete, where he was arrested. On Friday at around midnight, he switched on his phone and the detectives picked his signal. The suspect was since then been under police custody, has not shown any remorse. As the detective said that he was shocked to see his family members crying and mourning the deaths, he bought some pepper, which he would bite or spray in order to tear to appear like he was also mourning. The exhibits recovered had been drawn into a pit latrine. He even took the detectives to an open field in the same area where he burned some of the evidence. The father had arrived in Kenya from the United States of America about a fortnight earlier where he worked as a nurse. Two of his daughters survived the cold-blooded murder since they had gone to school the previous day. One of the sisters was a form for student at St. Angela Girls School, while the other was a form to student at Griambu Girls School in Kirinyaga. One of the witnesses in the case, Steve Jew, told the detectives that on the fateful day, they finished work and they proceeded to Karura's shopping center to relax after a hard day's work. He came back at around 9 p.m. and noticed that one of the curtains was blood stained but the lights were on. He got in and found his colleague James Kenyajui laying in a pool of blood on a mattress in one of the rooms. Police were called or later removed the body. However, before they left, they knocked at the gate of the adjacent home to find out if the residents had had anything during the fatal attack. There was no response and the officers concluded that the family had slept. Strange enough, the suspect watched everything from his parents' room upstairs. Even as police pros processed the primary scene and finally removed the body, the next day detectives were expecting to revisit the scene together with the suspect in what is referred as a scenery enhancement where the suspect was expecting to voluntarily give a detailed account of how the murder was organized from the initial planning to the execution and subsequent disposal of murder weapons. Everything, including the route used, how he scaled the wall, how the weapons were used, among other things, were documented. Autops of the slain victims revealed that they died from the fatal injuries that they had received from the stab wounds that were winged inflicted on them. This was and will remain to be one of the coldest murders that has ever been executed by a family member, not only in Kenya, but the whole of the African continent, and how he took pride in what he had done. Until now, Lawrence Waringi awaits is sentencing at the Indus Nairobi Industrial Area Prisons where the police are holding him since 2021 January and remembering that today it's 2023 January as we publish this video. That's it for now. Subscribe to FM African Documentary. My name is Felix Mwenda.